August heading to um, Pacific Northwest University for med school in Washington. Your attention to that, Eric. Hey, thank you guys for staying to the end. Over the past two summers, I've been looking at the proteins produced by human mast cells in the extracellular matrix. And then over this past semester, this project has also grown to include looking at prostate tissue looking at the same proteins in that tissue. So we'll go through some of the background and the key components of this research, look at the methods we've used, the results we've gotten, and then some future work that we hope will be done. Looking at cancer, it was originally thought that mutations were the main cause of cancer. However, now we know this isn't true, and that the main cause of cancer is actually disruption between the normal, stromal, and epithelial interactions. So carcinogens come in and disrupt this normal flow, causing changes in the structure and function. One way to see these changes is to look at the histology. On the left, we see normal prostate tissue. One of the key distinguishing features is the tall columnar epithelial layer. On the right, however, we see that that structure is lost and cells will become multinucleated and generally just lose the structure that we can see in the normal tissue. There are also changes happening at a molecular level. In a normal stroma, we have inflammatory cells and fibroblasts. These interact in the stroma and with the epithelial layer. As carcinogens are introduced, those inflammatory cells increase in number and fibroblasts become activated. With further activation, the stroma becomes cancerous. There are many inflammatory cells and the tumor develops. So this is all occurring in the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix is composed of three main parts. Structural proteins come from collagens and, or collagens and elastins. So in this figure, Collagen is this thick, dark band. Proteoglycans are the pink, gelatinous part of the matrix. And then the adhesive glycoproteins are what attach cells to the matrix. We'll look more closely at collagen as that, as that is what this project looks at specifically. Collagen is the most abundant part of the extracellular matrix, and it's what gives the extracellular ma cellular matrix its strength. It's secreted by many types of fibroblasts, and is a group of closely related proteins. The collagen molecule is made up of three major parts, the amino propeptide, variable region, and the triple helix. When we're looking for the collagen molecule in tissue or in the mast cells, we're using antibodies that target some part of this variable region. When we target that variable region, we use a primary antibody and then a secondary antibody. So when our proteins are expressed on a cell, our primary antibody can attach to that protein. We then use a secondary antibody that's been fluorescently tagged, and it's that fluorescent tag that we see under the microscope that will show us if our protein is present. These figures come from some of the prostate research that I said we were starting to look at just this semester. These are not fluorescent stains, but are dab stains, and so we see the presence of collagen because of an oxidation reaction rather than the fluorescence. On the left, we see low-grade prostate cancer that has low cytoplasmic staining, whereas the high-grade prostate cancer was shown to have high cytoplasmic staining, and this difference was seen to be statistically significant. On the other hand, when we look at membrane staining, the low-grade prostate cancer has a high amount of staining, but the high-grade prostate cancer has low membrane staining. This would show us that the collagen is changing locations, is moving locations as the cancer develops. We can also see this when we look at the surgical margins. 
are still cancerous cells present in the tissue. We've also used various antibodies looking at collagen 11 in prostate, in prostate tissue. And we can see that the cells are being stained, attaching to different portions of that collagen molecule, both in normal and cancerous tissue. So just a reminder of the role of inflammation in cancer. We have inflammatory cells in normal tissue as well, but they increase in number and are activated in cancerous tissue. One of these types of cells is the mast cell, which releases inflammatory chemokines. These inflammatory chemokines can stimulate tumor progression or can inhibit tumor progression. And whether or not this is help, whether or not the overall effect is helpful towards tumor progression depends on different contributing factors and how much of each occurs. Mast cells, as I said, are one type of inflammatory cell and are the type of cell that we looked at specifically in this project. They occur throughout the stroma, but happen more frequently near blood vessels, neurons, and external cell, external surface interfaces. You may be more common with them for their role in inflammation or allergic responses. They provide, because they provide inflammatory mediators when activated. However, because of their chemical complexity, much of their function is still unknown. Different studies in the past have looked at mast cells and their link to cancer because of the chemokines they produce. However, it's been shown both that mast cells, the accumulation of mast cells is beneficial to tumor growth, and at the same time, it is harmful to tumor growth. And so, and so the literature is still debatable as to which way mast cells go or if they're doing both. One previous study looked at mast cells, which are these brown stain cells with CD117, a known mast cell marker. These stain cells were stained with a collagen 11 antibody. So we see that mast cells do contain collagen 11 because they're being stained with it here. From that research comes our purpose in looking for different extracellular matrix molecules, particularly collagen 11, in human mast cells, both prior to and after stimulation with LPS. One particular thing about our mast cell line is that these are immature mast cells. While they contain many of the parts that mast cells have, they are lacking kinase and this FC epsilon RI complex. So this could be problematic in the future as those may be important parts in the expression of collagen. To grow our cells, we kept them in an iron supplemented media and let them just grow for a few days without touching them. After this time, we would stimulate the cells for either 48 to, or 72 hours with LPS. We also tried stimulating for 24 hours, but the results were very similar to unstimulated cells, and so we stayed with these two times. At this point, we would stain our cells with these various antibodies. Collagen 11, B1B, and 1702 are all looking for that collagen 11 molecule. The B1B and the 1702 are just looking for those different parts of the variable region. And then CD117 was the no mast cell marker, so we're just confirming that we have mast cells and we're staining to see that they're there. To stain our cells, we would first adhere the cells to the slide, permeabilize, fix, and treat with hyaluronidase. And so these later steps allowed the antibodies to reach the inside of the cell, seeing if collagen wasn't just secreted on the surface, but if it was throughout the cell. We then incubate with the primary antibody looking for the specific part of the collagen and then the secondary antibody that was fluorescently tagged so that we would be able to see whether or not it was present. We also tested the effectiveness of our antibodies by staining rat sarcoma cells. These, these cells followed the same staining procedure as you just saw, but were stimulated with vitamin C instead and stained in a 6-6 
six well played rather than bursting on the slides. Some of the results from our human mast cell staining are here. We see our DAPI stain, which stains the nucleus of the cell. And you'll notice that there are quite a few, quite a few more cells in our negative control on the bottom. This is simply due to the field that was chosen when the image was taken. There is no change because of the staining between these two. So we see that our cells are present. And our this red part is where our secondary antibody has attached and is shown with fluorescence. In our negative control, no primary antibody was used. And so the secondary antibody could not attach. And we see that it's missing. We also have images using confocal microscopy. And we see cytoplasmic staining in blue throughout. We also see various antibodies that are working at different portions of the collagen 11 molecule staining the cytoplasm and the membrane in these cells. One thing we did notice throughout the summer was that the human mast cell line we were using changed in morphology. This could be another reason for some of our varied results in staining. Our old mast cells um, have a very different morphology than a new shipment we received during the summer. So this may play a part along with the fact that we have an immature cell line. So as this research continues, we hope to look at the contents following activation of these cells quantitatively by using ELISA's. We also hope to continue to determine the effectiveness of antibodies by using those rat sarcoma cells and positive controls. We hope to continue to gain the confocal microscopy images for our staining results and to be able to do a comparison of our current cell line, the HMC ones, with an LED2 cell line, which is a more mature form of the human mast cell. Finally, we're working on further statistical analysis of one antibody in particular, B1B, in both the human mast cell and in the prostate. I'd like to acknowledge MSTMRI, Embry, Dr. Oxford at BSU, Dr. Nixon here at NNU, Dr. Franz, and previous NNU students who have worked on this project. Thank you, and I'll open up for questions. It looked like early on that um, all you need, were, I don't remember what it was, just Daffy. I don't know which stain it was, it was staining collagen. Was that enough to really detect prostate cancer? Is that quantitatively the worst it can be a low and high? Can you just make a graph and figure out how you are on the Gleason scale from that? That's why you're really flat. 